Good afternoon, and welcome to the <clears throat> panel discussion on how to be published. We have a lot of people here today that, that write, and they wonder sometimes, how does a person get started being published? Where do I start? Where do I go? So welcome, and thank you for being here today. Also, thank you to all of you that are here today on technically is the first real spring-like Saturday <laughs> we've had in about a year. So it's wonderful that you're giving some time on this lovely Saturday afternoon to join us for this conversation. I want to say thank you also to the Marshall Lyon County Library for joining with the Read Local Committee of the Marshall <coughs> Area Fine Arts Council, MAFAC, for today's panel conversation on how to get published. It's our first of what we hope is several more uh, partnerships in the future. And special thanks to Paula Nemes and Emily Rose Rasmussen for all of their help in getting this panel discussion organized. Just a little background on how today's conversation came to be. We were hearing through the grapevine that there's a lot of folks in the area that write and they'd like to be published but they don't know where to start. So we said, well, we know some people that have gone through that process. They have explored uh, the experience of publishing, and so we invited them to be with us today to share with the audience members uh, what they went through to be published and how to be published. Uh, our four authors today, they have some things in common, and they also have some very different experiences and we'll have time to talk about that in our conversation. We're also going to have time for questions at the end of today's panel discussion, so uh, please be thinking about that and feel free to do so. Also, we have wonderful cookies from one of the Mayfax sponsors, Perkins, so we thank them. And we also have treats, uh, water, so please help yourself. And we decided that we're going to be casual enough today that if during the conversation you have a deep burning desire for one of those cookies or one of those miniature <laughs> Snickers, go on over and help yourself, but please enjoy the treats. I'd like to welcome at this time our authors, Jim Zarzana, Susan McLean, Dana Yost, and Chris Schmitz. And when I wrote my little script, I just happened to put their names in that order and look how they, and I didn't even tell them to do that. So, wow, you know. And I also would like to welcome Nicole DeBoer, he, uh, the executive director for the Southwest Minnesota Arts Council. And a little later this afternoon, she's going to let you know about grant opportunities for writers that are available through SMOC. And then also Michelle Leininger, the director of the Marshall Lyon County Library, she's also going to touch on some opportunities for writers. So you talk about Kismet. Just yesterday, I'm here at the library checking out a book, and I happened to check out a book by Larry McMurtry. And I'm reading the introduction to this book, and he writes, life and art alike are filled with accidents. And what he meant by that is, you have something that happens in your life by chance, and it changes your life forever. So Larry McMurtry had been in college, he'd had one creative writing course. And he had some assignments in that course. And he happened to take one home for the summer, and he was going to work on his father's very large cattle ranch in Texas. And just before he left, he happened to read something by Yeats. It's a very long poem. I'm sure you're familiar with it. But he ends the poem with, cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen, pass by. And Larry McMurtry writes, he read that and it just changed his life forever. He had to be a writer, so he spent that summer working his dad's ranch, taking what had been an assignment in that creative writing course, and he turned it into Horseman Pass By. And if you're not real familiar with that title, later it became a movie starring Paul Newman and Patricia Neal and Melvin Douglas called HUD. So Horseman Passed By, Larry McMurtry's book, 
turned into the film HUD. And I thought, wow, I mean, how lucky am I to just yesterday check that book out and read that introduction. So it gave me the idea that I wanted to start, I wanted to start things today by asking our authors, you know, when was your moment? When was your Yates moment or your aha that aside from what you were doing elsewhere in your life, in a career, when did you know you wanted to become a writer? And I'll start with Jim. Jim had a long career in academics. So aside from that, when did you just know well, you had to be even, a writer? Even as a, a grammar school kid, um, uh, I wanted to write and did write. Uh, and, and I remember I got in trouble one time. One of the, I was educated by Irish Catholic nuns, and uh, one of them asked me what I wanted to be, and I said, uh, I want to be a writer. And she said, well, you know, your handwriting's terrible and you can't spell. And I said, sister, I'll buy a dictionary and a typewriter. And she got mad at me, you know, and I thought, wait, I thought this out. But uh, Marsco uh, started actually up on campus. Um, um, it was just, I was going to have a sabbatical. It was April. April 15th, my taxes were done, and I, and I was going to have a sabbatical, and uh, so I wasn't gonna teach from the end of summer school in the summer until January, and I wanted to write a single volume sci-fi novel that would make me rich and famous, and, and it turned into four novels, and I just started writing, and, and uh, I didn't tell Mary Ann, I wrote for two weeks, and our daughter, uh, who was would have been 12 at the time, and this was 97, so uh, Marsco didn't get published till 2013, so I started in 97, so it's a long haul. But that, I think that was the moment I said, I'm just gonna do this. If I don't do it, I'm gonna regret it, and I'm gonna turn sabbatical into, and I got a novel and a half out of sabbatical, and the other three, no, uh, two and a half novels came later, and you know, so here I sit. That answers your question. Susan, your moment. I had written a lot of poetry in high school. I was even on the literary magazine. But just in the transition from high school to college, I had a couple of very discouraging experiences. In one, a professor was uh, ridiculing my poetry because I wrote in rhyme and meter. And in another, uh, when I got to college, I applied to get into a poetry workshop and I was rejected. So um, at that point, I decided, well, maybe being a poet really isn't for me. So. I studied literature and went on to become a professor, but for 19 years I wasn't writing poetry. And after I came here, a couple years in, I was talking to Phil Dacey, the poet. I read a lot of his poetry and really admired it. And I mentioned I used to write poetry. And he said, well, if you ever want to start again, I'd be glad to look over what you've written. And so I started writing <coughs> again and showing him what I'd written. And it was just electrifying how interesting I found that and how much I was getting out of the experience now. So I couldn't stop once I started. I think you get a point where you're old enough that no amount of discouragement is enough to keep you from doing what you really want to do, and I had reached that point. Dana, you spent a lot of years in the newspaper business, but aside from that, when did you have your, your moment well, <clears throat> two, two things. I grew up in Minneota. Um, Bill Holmes' house was five houses from where I grew up, around the corner. But he was gone my entire high school and childhood. He was on, he's a generation older than me. So Bill is not what led me to be a writer, hmm. which now, of course, I follow, I follow everything he wrote. But um, for me, the, it came when I was in seventh grade. Um, a, a teacher named Mrs. Gigstad taught us uh, English, and um, we had to do some writing there. And I did a paper as a seventh grader about nuclear pro proliferation. And it, as I got writing, started writing, I got angrier and angrier. And so it became this opinion piece. <laughs> and I got great feedback from her. We, we sat and talked about it, and that was the first click. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, oh, this is really cool. I can expand my thoughts on, into um, paragraphs, into print. Then the, the, there was actually two parts. One, the other was I grew up in a household of sports. You know, my dad was a coach and the athletic director. 
and I played sports for him. But then by the time I was like 14 or 15, I realized I was going to suck at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I still wanted to follow sports. So, um, as a junior, then in high school, I started writing for the weekly newspaper in Minneota, and I started to read larger national sports writers and read how they wrote scientifically. What are you doing? How are they writing like this? I want to write like that. And then I just kept pushing it. Um, in college, I worked at the Independent in here, in town, and that just kept making me, uh, you know, the writing just kept growing in me. So the two, you know, the very first time you see your name in print as the author, that maybe that's the, the second real trigger. It's like, I wrote that. People in town saw that I wrote that. My mom saw that I wrote that, and a pastor muster, so <laughs> that was the second thing. So then it, it grew from that into writing poetry, writing creative nonfiction, but those are the two. But the first was just the seventh grade paper. Thanks, Dana. Chris? Yeah, I always loved stories. Um, growing up, I, I grew up reading a lot as a kid. Um, uh, I grew up in the 80s, and uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of very inspiring stories coming out and when I talk about stories I mean there's all sorts of mediums I mean, there's, there's movies there's television uh, there's comic books there's books um, there's video games now is a, is a big one especially for a younger generation where these these are ways we consume stories and uh, so I've always been just just really enthralled with with stories telling them as well as as, as living them um, and I, I remember very distinctly so the answer is probably taxes uh, <laughs> Our local government, small community, I remember this, you, know, you envy, because it's kind of on the edge of town, you envy the couple of kids who are in town, they're like, get to talk about these cool shows on TV, because they have cable. And uh, they passed a city referendum, hey, everybody's going to be able to get cable hookups now, it's new technology, we're going to run cableized to everybody, if you're in town, you can have cable. I'm like, yes, finally, because my life was boring in the 80s, at least it seemed like it. Um, and then, I remember, like, the, the year came when I'm like, how can we have cable? Come on, guys. And uh, my parents are like, well, they, there's this big field between my house at the edge of city limits. Mm -hmm. And then tell them, the city's like, yeah, it's too expensive to run a cable line out there. So you guys, yeah, thanks for paying your taxes, but you don't get it. So I wound up reading a lot of books because I didn't get any TV <laughs> stations. And by, uh, I think my librarian hated me, uh, but I think she hated me on purpose. Uh, a lot of times, because I would always check out books that I think she thought was well beyond me, and, and I, I'm definitely a fighter. Uh, when somebody uh, challenges me, I tend to rise up to the occasion. And so I think she tried to discourage me, and that only made me want to read them all the more. And so, I mean, I was well beyond where all my peers were uh, in school with what they were reading. I mean, they're, you know, they're reading Dick and Jane, and I'm like, The Hobbit, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, so... Uh, I think maybe she knew what she was doing. Um, maybe not. Maybe the guy was probably a I was probably a stupid little kid. But regardless, she she somehow inspired me to write and uh, or to read. And then one thing just led to another. And I always loved to to tell stories, probably to try and get out of trouble initially, and and then also to to expand them and to create my my own worlds. Um, sometimes what's going on up here is preferable to what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, you know, growing up in the 80s through, through Jacob Wetterling, through Oklahoma City bombing, through things that were really starting to rock our world then. And I mean, I think we're gonna have this great new crop of writers because things aren't getting any better, so, but the fiction is. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is you can't be too young, but you can't be too old to start writing. You can start writing at any time in your life whenever that profound moment comes along or the opportunity comes along where you say, well, I'm gonna do it now. Uh, just very quickly, don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but you know, the audience is filled with writers, probably all have their own sense of discipline uh, before they get ready to send in some manuscripts or some poetry, but they have their own sense of discipline. And again, in that little essay I wrote, or list, read yesterday with Larry McMurtry, that summer that he wrote uh, Horseman Pass By, he thought five pages a day. I will write five pages a day. Sometimes he wrote more than that, but he never wrote less than five pages a day. Uh, what's your discipline, Dana? I'll start with you. 
It's probably roughly the same. I'll write for about two hours in the morning, and at least you know, seventy percent of it I throw away right away <laughs> or I delete it off my laptop. But at least I'm writing, um, and, and then the rest I keep. Um, but I have a, a set time frame more than a set amount of um, length I want to write. But every day I try to write that um, that that much. Um, some of it's prose, some of it's poetry. And the, the poetry is a lot harder for me to write because it, it's, it, you know, it's so precise and you're looking for the, the sound and the symbol. So that, that, I can get lost in one poem for the, that entire two hours. But, it, so that's the big thing. Just, but it Chris, is, well, uh, uh, Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Come I, on in. I, uh, <coughs> I, I like to, so I write, a, I keep a blog. Um, I would recommend anybody here to, to check them out. Almost everything that I talk about you can find on, online. At, but the very first thing I do every week is I write in a report, and this is what I did last week. Here's what I will accomplish this week. So I find ways to keep myself accountable um, and give myself realistic goals and then try and meet them. I use a lot of tools uh, that, that help track word count. Um, word processors are great. Uh, if you have a small budget to invest in anything, I highly recommend getting Scrivener. It's like $60, and it has some built-in features if you're thinking about doing like a NaNoWriMo or something like that, where it, it, it helps keep you on track by giving you reminders. Um, but So I, I keep myself accountable, and I tend to write, I try and write about 4,000 words a week, about two chapters. Um, sometimes I write a lot more in it. Very seldom do I not make it because... I know I'm gonna I'm gonna tell all my friends if I if I achieve my goal or not uh, at the beginning of next week. Susan, poetry is a little different. And when I first started writing poetry, I thought I have to wait for the ideas to come to me. <coughs> and sometimes a lot of them came, and sometimes it was long periods of time in between. But I gradually discovered a few techniques that worked. Um, sometimes the ideas come when I don't have time to write them but I would um, keep a notebook file, and I would type into my notebook file whatever the idea was, and set it aside until I had time to work on it. But then when I actually did have the time, I already had a few ideas written down that I, I could work on. And I also discovered that actually sitting down and telling yourself I'm going to write now, even if you don't have an idea, produced a lot more than I expected it would. That actually, sitting down and, and, and starting to work on something, even if you don't have the idea, can lead to things unexpectedly. So I didn't think I had that kind of discipline where poetry was concerned, but when I tried it, I discovered that I did, and so these days I'll often go to an office for a couple of hours at least and say, okay, this is my writing time, and I'm going to either work on ideas I already have or try to generate ideas and work on those. I picked up translating poetry, so if I don't have any ideas of my own, I pick poems I really like in other languages and try to translate them into poems in English. And that means I can keep working even if I don't have my own ideas. Jim. Oh, if I could oh just, sure. Susan, if she got an idea, she'd write it in her notebook. Um, I was a newspaper guy, and we'd work on the fly on daily deadlines. <coughs> Whatever paper you had sometimes. <laughs> I wrote this as I was driving today, so you didn't. <laughs> it's a half an outline for an essay, so you, don't meet me on the road. But, I, you know, we, <laughs> but you do. When an idea strikes, you, you don't want to yeah. forget it. So. Uh, well, I, I write every day. I write something uh, every day. Right now, I'm editing, which is the harder part of writing. Uh, uh, writing a first draft is easy, and now, especially with a computer, you know, you, you, you format it, you save it, you can sit down and, and, you know, work until you have a migraine or you're so hungry or you, you just have to, you're bursting for something. And, I mean, you can just sit there, and that has to be edited uh, and, and edited and edited and edited, and, and anything I publish is probably, I've read it 40 or 50 times. Um, and so, um, a good day, I'll get four hours of work in. Uh, if I'm writing fresh, like Dana said, two hours, probably five or six pages. You know, and if I write a lot, I mean, if I have a really good day where I get ten pages, the next day I'm shot. But like uh, Susan said, sit down, just create a space, 
and a time and sit down. And if, and if what you want to be working on isn't coming, write in a journal, write something, just write every day. Faulkner said, don't be a writer, be writing. So be writing, you know, just every day. So for our authors uh, in the audience today, so whatever their discipline is, might be very regimented and organized, it might be more on the fly. So you're all writers, you've written something, now here comes the first really big question. I, I want you all to share with them, how did you take that first step? How did you begin? And you can talk about things that went right and you look back on it now and you think, well, I was lucky there. That turned out okay. But maybe some, some pitfalls or mistakes that you made that maybe you can help other people avoid. But um, one of the problems with being a really close friend with a panelist is I kind of know some of the answers to my questions before I ask them. So I'm going to say to Jim, don't get into editing until a little bit later because I have a question specifically oh, about okay. editing. Okay. Um, and that's going to be some of the good advice that, that they all share with you is when you get to that editing process and a publisher does want to publish you, but first they got to do a little editing. We're going to talk about that too. Okay. But before that, Let's talk about that first step. They, they, they've never submitted anything. Okay. They don't know who to submit it to, how and where. So okay. Susan, would you want to start that one? I made a lot of mistakes when I first started trying to get published. Now, if you just want to have your friends and family read your work, self-publishing is the way to go. But if you want people outside of your circle to read what you've written, you have to submit it and get it published. You'll never get a book of poems published if you haven't published individual poems before you try to get the book published. So my problem was that I wrote in rhyme and meter, which was out of fashion almost everywhere. And trying to find the places that I could submit the poems to that would take it seriously was very, very difficult. And so you need to have ways to find who publishes the kind of thing you write. And that's the hardest thing of all. So you need to have some idea by reading other people who write something that's remotely like what you write, where do they get published? That's one way to find the right places to get published. But there are also um, other resources you can use. There's something called Duotrope, mm -hmm. which is an online uh, database of all journals that publish fiction and poetry and nonfiction. How do you spell that? D-U-O-T-R-O-P-E, it, it's one word. Now, it used to be free. When I started it, it was free. They now charge $50 a year to have access to all of their information. But they have lists of what the editors are looking for. They have interviews with the editors. If there are certain genres that they publish, then you can find out which genres they publish. You can find out how many submissions they get, what percentage of submissions they accept, how long it takes them to reply. So this was useful for me, and it's also a way to enter all of your submissions so you keep track of when you sent them, where you sent them, how long it's been, whether it's time to send a letter asking for some kind of response because you haven't heard anything for a while. So for me, that, that makes things a little easier. But um, when I first started out, I just kept track of everything on paper. Uh, it was a little easier to keep track of it online. And this was a source of a lot of information that was usable. But the other way is to um, meet other people who publish similar things online, say. There are online workshops. And you get advice from them where they publish. And that was incredibly useful to me, to find out where other people who wrote the same kind of thing were publishing and where they'd recommend and places they'd warn you against because mm -hmm. they'd had bad experiences. Mm -hmm. All of that's very, very useful. Thank you, Susan. Chris, your first step. Uh, let me piggyback on what she said. Duotrope is phenomenal. Uh, there are a couple of other resources out there. Um, uh, Writer's Market, um, which is a book back there. There's a website called Writer's Digest. Uh, there's also Query Tracker, also has a lot of tools on it that are also very helpful. Uh, and Query Tracker is a great way to keep track of when you send it, how you send it. Use that with Duotropes, and that will uh, allow you to really track what you're doing. 
but yeah, definitely you gotta, it, it almost seems like you can't get published until you've been published. Um, there's this cyclical problem with breaking in uh, and it is, there is no simple answer because it depends really on, on the genre and so many different things. But how did I break in? Well, was that the question? Well, um, your first step, how did, how, yeah, what did uh, you find that I worked? I also made a ton of mistakes. Um, I, uh, I just started kind of setting out some issues. I had no idea what, what I was doing. I just knew that I liked writing. I didn't know anything about publishing. I think the first, uh, actually, so when I started writing, I was writing some science fiction. And uh, it, was, it was in somebody else's universe. It was kind of a fan fiction thing. Actually, it was uh, Timothy Zahn, who's a phenomenal science fiction author. He's going to be in Minnesota, I think, in two months at an event I'm going to be at. Uh, it was in one of his universes. And so I actually just called his publisher, like, hey, how do you do this? And they're like, yeah, everything that you're thinking is wrong. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I kind of went down to square one. And uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm like, well, none of this is usable then. Um, two, as I reread it, I'm like, it's also not good. Uh, so I'm going to start my own kind of universe that, that I'm writing in. <laughs> Uh, and eventually I did find a publisher who was a small press for that. I learned how to query. I used a lot of just Google searches. How do I do this? What's the, what's the next step? And the problem with, with a blind internet search, um, like you had mentioned, go to places and find out what other people are doing so you know what you like. When you, because of advertising, if you search just for how do I do this, you're gonna get bombarded with people that want to make money off of you as a writer. And they're going to they're going to try and sell themselves as a legitimate publisher to sell you uh, their publishing services or packages, and that's not real publishing. That's uh, those are vanity presses, and they're um, they are aggressive, and uh, they will try and flatter you into thinking that you know we want you for your, you're going to be the next great thing. And luckily, uh, I. Luckily, I could smell that there was something kind of wrong when they first started really, really chasing me down. And I mean, I did, I barely had, I mean, it, it would have been a struggle for me to go out and buy something off of the dollar menu at McDonald's at the time. Uh, that's how broke I was. And uh, I'm thinking, man, this just doesn't seem right. And luckily I found some other websites that uh, I don't think are like Predators and Editors, which is not around anymore. Oh, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, there, there are some threads that kind of keep it alive on some of the major authors forums. Uh, so you can get that same information, but find legitimate resources. Um, when you find an answer to a question, don't stop at once. Do your research every step of the way. Uh, and like I said, I eventually found a small publisher that um, really liked what I was doing. They were behind it. They eventually folded. And uh, so my, that book is, is still available because of uh, self-publishing tools and resources out there. But uh, use, use quality websites, referrals, and go to, a, go to a writer's conference. I mean, yeah, I didn't, have, I didn't have $2 to my name. Now I have, I have just a little more. And uh, I, try, I, I invest in myself by going to a writer's conference every year. This last year I took my daughter. Um, who is also has completed her first novel at 14 and she wants to do it right and I want her to do it right so I'm like learn let's let's find out what you need to know for the next step and for her it was editing but you'll you'll always find something that you need at, at an author's conference um, take copious notes meet other people find out find out what is good what is quality because uh, if, if you don't know if you don't know where that threshold is there are a lot of people who try and sell you something um, like people tried for me. And, uh, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of writers losing a lot of money because uh, they don't really understand how the process works. So make sure that you find out how that works and um, do it right. But learn how to write a query letter. I would start with Writer's Market. And that's when I re, re kind of started doing what I was doing. Um, I used Writer's Market religiously and that really, really helped me out. Jim, your first step. Well, um, <laughs> I use the Writer's Market and sent out 100 query letters. Uh, Marianne proofed them all. Uh, I think the best thing you can do is marry somebody who knows that you're a writer and accepts that. I, I mean, I, I just, uh, uh, she never stood behind me while I was working and said, if you didn't write that damn book, you'd paint the bathroom. So, you know, I, I didn't have to fight that battle. But, and Marianne's working today, otherwise she'd be here. But no, I sent out 100 traditional query letters uh, this is when you had to stamp things, and some wanted a self-addressed postcard, stamp post, some wanted a self-addressed envelope. Uh, I must have sent 
90 query letters to uh, of 100 to the rudest literary agents I ever met. Uh, I was really surprised at how nasty they could be. I got answers for everything from, why did you send me this? You know, I, to a, a person apparently somewhere like in the writer's market said, I don't want sci-fi, so I'd sent uh, uh, mistakenly to people that said, oh, in the old days when people bought books, I could have sold this manuscript. So I had, you know, ups and downs and ups and downs. Somebody grabbed the manuscript out of a slush pile and emailed me, I hope this book hasn't sold, and da da da. And I, uh, you know, forcing was email, I sent her the whole thing, and a month later she wrote back, I can't bond with your characters. <laughs> and I thought, you didn't read this <laughs> because I'm bonded with them. Uh, but anyway, I did that, and then uh, Neil Smith, who's uh, the chair of the English department and uh, does more uh, crime and gritty kind of thing, he just did a presentation here, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, he had a, an agent, had a traditional press, that wasn't going so well, and he had turned to self-publishing and, and said, why don't you just self-publish? And so that's what I did, and actually Dana helped uh, get my first book up on uh, Kindle, and again, I was so naive. I thought, oh, it'll be available on Kindle, it'll sell like that, you know. Which isn't so far-fetched, because The Martian was that way. I don't know if you know the story of The Martian, but that self-published, was giving it away for free, and the same week, and it became a huge success, and the same week that uh, uh, a, somebody called and said, I want to uh, make this into a movie, a press called and said, I want to publish your book, you know, so there's a career right there. So that, uh, I go to, uh, go to sleep every night saying a prayer to him, okay, send some of your juju this way. <laughs> so anyway, I decided uh, that I would self-publish, and uh, s um, there's a big literary conference for creative writing called AWP, which, uh, unless you're an academic, you don't need to go to AWP, but uh, Mary and I went to AWP, and, and uh, the first one I went to, there, there were just ranks and ranks of people saying, don't ever self-publish, it's the death of your career, don't ever self-publish. And five years later, I was at another one, and CreateSpace, which is Amazon's self-publishing wing, had table after table, they sponsored speaker after speaker, and I mean, just in those few years, everything switched. 70% um, of the books that are being published right now are self-published. Uh, and we're looking at a million a year, so 700,000. That's way too many people are self-publishing things that aren't ready. Uh, but so be ready. You've got to do the work editing. We'll talk about editing in a minute. But uh, I, it's spendy. I absorb costs that a publisher would ordinarily absorb. Uh, so I'm paying for the formatting. I'm paying for the cover design. I, I, I just told Marianne, I'm just going to I'm just going to throw money at this problem. I'm going to be very democratic here. I'm going to throw money at this problem and hope <laughs> it gets fixed. And and uh, anyway, uh, it's worked out for me. Uh, uh, the books are available anywhere you can get on the internet. I have had sales in Europe. Uh, I, actually, I'm going to be speaking in Sweden this summer. So um, you know, it's given me some credibility. Uh, I get into libraries. I get into schools. Uh, I do workshops. Um, so and and uh, you know and I've and I've always got the books you know so uh, the books do not exist until somebody orders one uh, so I bought these to to sell to you guys but uh, the the books aren't sitting in a warehouse somewhere uh, they can't be remaindered so there are some advantages uh, as long as I'm alive and my literary executors who are Marianne and our daughter uh, the books will exist uh, uh, unless a traditional press picks them up or something which I'm open to. Um, but that's the route um, that I went. Uh, so, yeah, Dana helped get the first one up, and, and we'll talk about editing in a minute. So, mm -hmm. And Dana, your story. Well, I'll, I'm going to touch on, try to do one sentence a piece on a few of what, what everybody else here said. Um, there are different ways to self-publish. Some are in these vanity presses that will cost you between three and $10,000 up front. You might get 50 books of your own and then split the profits with them on the rest, and they might get a big piece of the profit. Yeah. Create space, um, I've helped other people publish that way, including Dana, um, and I've helped, actually my last book is to save my publisher money, we went through Create Space. No or little upfront money, it's pay as you go. Um, they print on demand, it's robotically printed, but the quality is getting better and better. You know. You know, there's not, not like a human con quality control person sitting there at the end of the press looking, oh yeah, okay, these are on, but it's getting better and better. So 
that would be the way to go if you're going to self-publish. That's, to me, that's far and away. The only guy I know who's made, I have a, well, one friend, I'm, this is more than one sentence, one friend of mine, self-published, he still has books in his basement. He goes to rummage sales. He goes to craft fairs. He owed $20,000, hardcover book. He's trying to make it back. It's been nine years. <laughs> He's not even close to making it. Marty Seifert, the former lawmaker from here, mm -hmm. brand name, built-in brand name recognition. He self-published this really cool murder mystery book. Uh, Sundown and Sunrise. Yeah, and it's, it's a fiction based on a real thing. And he made his money back. He had to pay a lot up front, but he had enough sales. He worked his butt off. He was at events every weekend, every weeknight, but he sold. That's still the better way to go. Um, what Susan said, you know, Phil Dacey told me this to this po uh, the poet, the late poet, he's a mentor to me. So with digital publishing, both in print, digital, and ebooks, there's this huge new sea out there, many more publishers, because it's easier, faster, less expensive to publish a book and they don't have to be the big publishers in New York or an academic press. Lots more opportunities. Lots more writers who have access to these presses all around the country because they, you know, they get online, they go through writer's market, all these places. This winter I sent a chapbook to a publisher in, a chapbook's a little smaller book. This is a chapbook, very yeah. thin. Yeah. And I sent my manuscript to a very reputable publisher in San Francisco, and I thought I had tailor-made my poems to exactly what they were looking for. Two weeks ago, I got a rejection letter. Oh, God, did all this work? Read the next paragraph. There were 1,600 submissions. The, you know, I, I'm sure I didn't even get unwrapped out of the envelope. That is why there's 70 percent of the authors are self-published. It's you've got to be really, really good, or find the right, perfect match for your book, or have a little bit of luck to get published by a you know commercial or an academic publisher. Self-publishing is I mean it gets yourself in print. You know there's still issues about <coughs> where you know you can't bookstores usually won't take self-published books. Um, it's impossible to get into chains or even small independent bookstores. Um, there, there is a way with some of those, so you can use CreateSpace, uh, yes. and I have an article about this, but if you mirror your files over to Ingram Spark, um, then you can set the, set the book so that it can be returned, because bookstores do not want to assume the risk about carrying the stock on a product that they maybe can't sell. If you're willing to assume that and buy your books back, um, which you'll, if, if they order too many and wind up sending you some back, um, because you've set returnability to yes through Ingram Spark, which is almost identical to your CreateSpace um, listing, um, you you might lose like a dollar twenty per book. So if you're in a bookstore and able to do that, uh, whenever I do them, I do a lot of events with Barnes and Nobles. I always tell them, please don't order more than X number of books based on the event, because I know I'm not going to make money. I'm just trying not to lose money. I just want to meet your customers. To get yep to get yep. some branding out there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and and it, <clears throat> Phil told me one time when I was looking at the C, you know, and I go, oh, I should be able to get these books published. And Phil told me it's harder, again, because there's so many. So you want to be discerning. And this is what it, everybody said, research, look for the places that A, will match your, what you've written, and read, or at least look at the titles of those, that those places have published of other books. So, you know, so it's, it takes more work, but pick and choose, maybe rather than Jim's approach of sending a bunch out, which you maybe wouldn't do anymore with the no, electronic. But <laughs> I, I heard this this in January of a guy who sent out 500, I mean, you know, 500 submissions, and he's shotgunning it. And you might, somebody might say, yeah, and it might be totally wrong fit. And I had that happen to me with one book that did get published. And I got screwed left and right. You know, it was just bad experience. Um, so be picky and really you know, find a place that that um, is a good match because a they're going <laughs> to treat you better as a publisher. You're going to have a better relationship with the, with you, 
But B, you might have a better chance of breaking through that big C. There might not be, if you're a better fit, you might get looked at rather than being one of the 1,600 who are lost. Um, but still the best way, I think, is the personal way. Get to know <coughs> publishers, go to conferences, match make. If you know somebody who you like what they do, find out who, you know, who's their publisher. <coughs> if you, you know, ask them to hook you up with their publisher. You can get, get a, a, a coffee with them. But get personal. And, and that for me is I had just, my first books were totally a personal connection. A fluke and luck, circumstance, all of that. Um, and he'd actually rejected my first book, that ding dong. Um, his name is David Bikaski, and he runs Ellis Press and Spoon River Press. And uh, um, I'd sent him a manuscript maybe 10 years before, and psh, no. And in 2008, I sent him a poetry manuscript. And he's a guy I've known for 30 years. Um, <coughs> and within a week, he called me. He said, we got to do this. So by the fall of 2008, I had a book out. And then, so it was just a personal connection there. And I think you can get that. But, you, know, you have to be aggressive about it. That was you know, luck for me. But if you go to conferences, you go to events like this, you know, <coughs> find out, you know, Susan's had books published by a couple different publishers nationally or at academic places. How did that happen? Talk to her. Talk to me. Talk to Chris Jim. Don't do it all online, is what I'm saying. Because eventually the publisher wants to know you, trust you, know why you're writing that book, you know, that kind of, why he should care about it or she should care about it. So our writers here today, they persevere, they're disciplined, they're creating, they make personal connections, they do some research, they're trying to find out the best places to connect with or to at least approach. So let's say you do, and lo and behold, something is accepted. So now comes the next step, <coughs> editing. So what's it like when, when this this piece that you've written and and it's personal to you and you've worked on it for years or months or weeks and now somebody else is taking your baby and they're going to tell you about all these changes you should make and in a roundabout way aren't they saying you have to make these changes if you want to be published so Jim you want to start on what it's like to have someone tell you how to edit your work well um, Kathy Bernardi Jones who's a former student and a graduate of Southwest and has a business as an editor um, she's she's gotten to know the work pretty well and uh, she never I was never in a situation where uh, a publisher could say you know, we can't go forward because we don't like the ending or something like that. She she has, though, <laughs> sent me a fiery email one time. This character would never say that. Never. You know, you are wrong on this. So, you know, I, I've taken her advice. But so far I've avoided, uh, I met a writer, uh, and, and she does young adult fantasy, but she told me that her agent told her to rewrite 80% of the book, and I thought, you know what, that's not your book anymore. And <coughs> And for those of you that know me personally, I got a little bit of an arrogant streak. <laughs> and, and, you know, Marsco's my book. I mean, it's, it's my book. And, uh, and, and so I, I haven't had to face that. But as far as editing, I mean, I pay Kathy. And again, a traditional press is going to have an, an in-house copy editor. Uh, and they're going to assume those costs. And I assume those costs. So uh, I pay Kathy. Uh, she reads it twice. I pay her twice. Uh, and, and then... Uh, uh, you know, I, I work from that. She's given me some some very good advice. Uh, she's she's you know she catches little things where I change the name of characters and and uh, I thought I caught this, but I had a character and I couldn't make up my mind how old he was. And she kept putting margin you know electric electronic marginal notes. Would you please fix this? <laughs> he can't be 24 and then 25 and then 24 again. Would you fix this? Uh, so. Um, but when she did read book three, the email she sent me with book three, she said there were times when I got very angry at characters in here and there were times that I cried. 
And I thought, ooh, I'm doing something right. This is sci-fi. You're not supposed to cry over sci-fi, you know. <laughs> and so I'm doing something right. And it's really not sci-fi. It's something else. But So anyway, I've avoided that. But you, you, want it, you want to have it professionally edited. Somebody who did not write it. Um, I was just telling friends sitting up here in front that I wrote it, edited it, Kathy edited it. I was I had gone through a little bit and I, and I had a group of people sitting around the table passing around foot as opposed to passing around food. You know, they're not cannibals. And I, I mean, how many eyes had looked at that paragraph and foot and food are, you know, 75% the same, but it's just so easy. So, you know, you need somebody um, to, to read it. And, and I read everything out loud. When I think it's ready, I sit down uh, and uh, I, I read it out loud. And uh, you know, that's when you catch the little verbal ticks. Am I using this word too much? Um, different, different things. Does the dialogue, if you have trouble reading dialogue, no one spoke those words. Uh, so uh, reading it out loud. It's, you are investing a lot of time to be a writer if you want to do it right. Somebody Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, hits it with somebody that hasn't any talent at all. Uh, no offense. Uh, I'm judging a book by its cover and the movie previews. I haven't seen the books or read the books or seen the movies, but... The book needed an editor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, be aware that, as people have been saying, people try... I have a website and I get emails through the website every once in a while. Oh, I can help your career. And, you know, you're exactly the kind of writer I've made into a star, and you know, so delete that. Uh, and especially, I love the ones that are misspelled uh, <laughs> typos. So just work hard. Stop Dana, yourself. your editing experience. Um. Was it hard to give up something to somebody else and then take their advice and make the changes they want you to make? For the last 25 years of my journalism career, I was the boss. <laughs> so yeah, it was hard. Um, it still is hard. Um, but fortunately, Dave and I, he's done four of my books. We have a lot of give and take. I mean, he's still going to win a lot of it because he's paying for it. He's the publisher. Um, but at the end of the day, second end of the day, he says, it's your name on the spine, your name on the cover. It's your book. You know, you have to have, a, it's got to be the book you want it to be. It's got to have your voice. With my 1940 book, which is still pretty big, we spent a summer slugging it out. I mean, like, name calling. Because I spent two and a half years writing and researching that thing. And it's like, I'm not going to give that up. I'm not giving that up. And he says, well, I'm not going to publish it. <laughs> and so compromise, I cut. 60,000 words out of it, which is the length of some novels I took out of the book. Um, and it turned out okay. You know, um, but I also had four other people read it. Three of them are, two of them are historians. One is a professional journalist who, by trade, is a copy editor. Um, and he gave it a really, because uh, we trade, he's written a couple books. We give it a, he gave it a really hard edit. So we wanted to try to make it as good as we, as polish as we could. And yet, when the first edition, our first part came out, God, there's a typo here, there's a, this, this number's missing. So with Create Space, I could go back in and f add that stuff. Um, but the biggest part, I think, is to have, it, it, it always still comes back to trust, you know, and be able to have conversations. The, the publisher doesn't want to just hijack your book unless it's this publisher that I had a bad experience with from Dallas, they, they did. But the publisher wants, because they're going to want, maybe want to work with you again, uh, but they want it to be a book that is as much your book, because you're going to be the one out there talking about it, selling it, and they want to have a good working relationship. So that's the biggest thing was, uh, but yeah, I had to let go. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh no, he's telling me what to do. My friends who are reading it are telling me what to do. It's like, no, no. I. Nobody gets to tell me what to do, you know, except for these two, because I took classes from them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so you have, to, you have to shut your ego down, you know, I mean, because you're not the only one who is looking at this. If you sell it, you're not going to be the only one who reads it. Um, so you want it to be the best you can have it be, 
So you listen. I mean, and if, it, if the advice is bad, you let it go. But if it can help, take it in. You know? and, and it goes back into the overall publishing part, too. You, know, you can't be afraid of, of rejection because it's going to happen hundreds of times, dozens if not hundreds. The same when, when it's your manuscript. Kathy Jones is going to hit you hard because she wants, you're paying her to make her, your book better. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite authors is uh, Ernest Hemingway. And people who knew him, he was, his books were really lean, the, the prose was tight. People who knew him said that he was more ruthless on his own copy than any editor would be. He cut. He was not, not afraid to read it out loud, change. It's like, oh, this is a beautiful phrase. It's not making it into my book. So you have to be the same way. You know, but, and then when somebody tells you that too, you have to at least be open-minded. You know, it's your book, but you're looking for advice. Susan, your editing experiences. Poetry doesn't make money. It doesn't make it for the poet, and it doesn't make it for the publisher. So basically, you have to be your own editor, because somebody else is not going to get paid to edit your poems. <coughs> With poems, when you send them out, it's either going to be a yes or a no. It's not going to be, I'd like you to rewrite this part of it. So you have to get it as good as it can be before you submit it. My way of doing that is a poetry workshop. I have an online free poetry workshop that has a lot of other published poets helping one another. And they post their poems, and they get suggestions, and they make changes, and they do all that before they ever submit it anywhere. The only kind of editing that I've encountered in poetry is when I had a book accepted, occasionally the person publishing the book will say, I'd like you to leave out this one, this one, and this one. But they won't do anything else more than that. Maybe somebody might get a suggestion to rearrange the order of a few poems, but that's about it for editing in poetry. But sometimes you have to accept somebody else's opinion on your cover art, right? Mm -hmm. I, I do remember that about Susan, one of Susan's books that's over there. Uh, what's on the cover was not your first choice, correct? Well, sometimes you need permission to use a particular image. Yeah. So I wanted a Frida Kahlo. They couldn't get the permission. I had to find something else. Mm -hmm. How about you, Chris? <clears throat> I talk a lot about this. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, oh, except for uh, something you, you said at the beginning was, uh, was now that you're accepted, it's editing. Usually, in today's market, you have to be highly edited and highly polished before they'll ever say yes. Uh, they want their editors to do very little work if they have to do anything at all. In today's modern publishing scheme, publishing houses, um, they expect, because the competition is so fierce, they expect that if they love this book, uh, and they are saying yes, that this book is 100% ready to go as of now. Um, usually they're not, they are going to have editing, but that is ultimately what they're looking for. If, if, if they open up your, um, your page one on a submission query and you have a spelling mistake on page one, they are not reading past that mistake. That whole, that whole stack of paper goes in the trash because that's how, how fierce the competition is. Um, so not only does your, your writing have to be tight, but it has to be right. Um, my process for editing, and I haven't usually encountered uh, a whole lot of, of, of uh, editors with the publishing house saying, you know, you need to change this. I mean, I've always had more of suggestions, um, and, uh, and I've also had some of those things where, you know, scrolling through, I had somebody email me like, how is this person in this scene? I mixed up a name on somebody that wasn't there. And uh, I see this all the time, even in um, you know, the big four publishing houses that uh, when they publish books, it, they're run past hundreds of people and they, they can still slip in there. So don't be so discouraged. Um, but with things like CreateSpace, yeah, you can um, fix them quite easily. And uh, don't, be afraid to, don't be afraid to make the changes if you have to. Um, here's my process. <coughs> I finish my book. Uh, I'm happy, I write the end. Uh, I usually start working on my next project and I don't submit my book. Um, sometimes you need your ideas and your thoughts to kind of simmer. Uh, I know we, there's mention of you, know, you write down an idea and then you come back to it when you've got the time for it. Sometimes it's better because of that. You're really kind of stewed in that idea. Some other things have kind of intersected as far as different thoughts. 
and you, you, you make it better. Just like when you brainstorm, if you're in a group and you're like, we need to plan this event and somebody else makes a suggestion and then you guys are bouncing ideas off of each other. Sometimes you need that time. Um, so if you, as soon as you write the end, if you go back and you start uh, proofreading it, you will miss so many things because you know what you meant to write, not what you actually wrote. So my process is work on something else so that it's fresher. Uh, then I come back and I write another draft, uh, and then I write another draft, uh, and then, um, then I work on something else, I kind of let it sit, I'll have some other people read it. Uh, these are called beta readers. Uh, beta readers are your friends, your critique group, the people that, that you think it's good enough for them to read, but you know there's a lot of mistakes and you want them to uh, to circle them. I, I usually print copies for my beta readers. I'm like, mark this in paper. I'm going to throw it away at the end of the day. It's got errors, it's got mistakes. You can keep it if you want. If I get famous because of this, then you've got this and it's cool. Um, but it's easier for me to flip through and it's, it's, a, it's a little more, it's easier for the beta readers uh, that don't know how to use like the, the electronic margin notes, um, which can be a bit of a clunky system for some people. So then I go through after that round of beta uh, edits. And if I have somebody that said, you know what? This was a difficult phrase or paragraph. Um, knowing that, that I know what I meant to say, but they didn't, and I'm writing for them. I'm not writing for me. I mean, I'm writing for me, but if they're having trouble reading it, then, then I'm being a, a poor communicator. So if, if they don't understand that, I'm going to rewrite the whole, the whole paragraph. And to find the mistakes, here's a great way. Reading aloud is always a good idea. I usually do that towards the end because you'll, you'll pick up those mistakes. But when you're editing, go, go to the very end of your, of when you're, you're like, I'm going to go a new draft, I'm editing this, go to the last paragraph. Read that paragraph. Then read the paragraph before it because you, whenever you can isolate that, uh, that string that, uh, of, of sentences, and remove the context, because the context is what makes you know what it is, which is why they pass, they pass the foot around the table. Well, yeah, you know there's supposed to be food. You, you read the context and the descriptions. You know there's food that's supposed to be passed, but you didn't catch it. So if you isolate that, or even, and the best way is to read it, read it one sentence at a time from backwards, um, you'll, you'll, you'll catch a lot of those things. Uh, I also run it through Grammarly. Actually, I probably run it through Grammarly after about the second or third draft. Because um, Grammarly is contextual, it'll help you find those things. Uh, after my beta readers have read it and I'm pretty happy with it, I'll run it through Grammarly again. And then I run it through a program called Hemingway. Uh, Hemingway is free. Um, Hemingway will pick up on a lot of different things for you, like um, uh, how, how many uses of passive voice do you have, uh, which is a, a huge one that most, most of the times when people submit something and it's not ready, it's usually because uh, if it's fiction, because they, they just abuse the passive voice tense. That's the word was or any form of to be. Um, and uh, technically it's, it's different, but that's the one where it, that's the easiest. It's just fine wherever you say um, it, it was happening. And I, I talk about this a lot of authors. I'm like, John was running and John was running fast. And John, John would, would win the race. John was fast, he won. It's way more engaging, it's faster, it's much tighter prose. Um, and it will highlight every instance of passive voice for you. And it will give you a recommendation based on the length of, uh, of your manuscript, how many you should have in there. Uh, I like it so much, and even though it's free, uh, there's the, that optional pay link. I'm like, this is such a good tool, I'm, I'm buying this, and uh, I paid for it. Uh, but it's Hemingway.com or .org or something. But use that. Uh, and so then I, I went, I will go back after that, and then another draft, and pay an editor, and then I'm submitting a book. Uh, so it is a, a lengthy process, and you do have to really, really bunker, bunker down and, and really, really dig into it because it's not easy. Uh, and passive voice is the biggest one. I was a member of a critique group, and uh, man, I thought I'd written something great, and they just unloaded on me. I'm like, it's like, like I wanted to cry. It was so hard. This was very early in my writing career, and I. I really, really hit that whole, you know, keep the, keep the tension alive, eliminate the passive voice. And now when I use, uh, I'll use both Grammarly and, and Hemingway. And Hemingway will give me like, it'd be like you can have like 6,500 uses of passive voice in a manuscript this size. It's like you have like 4,000, like way under, way under the limit, which is why my, my narratives are very tense. The action moves and, and it just refuses to let you go. 
But then I looked and I'm like, I've got all sorts of other problems and uh, things. So once you can get rid of one thing, you got something else to focus on. And it's good to have those voices telling you where the problem is. Once you realize that you're, you're writing for other people to read it, because you know what you meant to say, it makes it a little easier to kill your babies. Because uh, I really, I mean, it's your book, but if, I mean, if you're trying to get people to read it and they're having trouble with it, you didn't raise it right. Um, so it, it's very, it's the hardest thing to do but it's something you absolutely must do uh, if you're going to have something that you that's capable of surviving once you release it into the wild. Thank you. Jim. Well, I've always believed. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to add to before before you get the a manuscript ex accepted, there's a part of the process of of submitting it, and most publishers do not want to see your whole book. They don't even want to see anything in paper. Um, they have specific websites or spots on their websites for submitting and they may only want to see a cover letter table of contents maybe chapter summaries and then they, if they if that gets past their screening they might write right back and say well we want to see one chapter or half a chapter or two chapters then you send them that and they'll say nah it's i'm not bonding with this character whatever you know they they don't want they want it all digital because there's such a volume so just that's, keep that in mind too. Is publishers do not want hard copy books. Let me comment on that. Um, while I do all of that work to edit my book, I do that all of those things about six times for just the first chapter, and I spend most of that in the first two pages, because if you can't grab them in the first two pages, um, they're probably going to pass. Did you have something you want to add? Uh, just that the, every, whether you're sending it to a website, I mean to a editor or a, anything, it's almost all electronic and they have specific things that they want and, uh, you know, and that's what they want. So, you know, read their instructions and it's not like college professors where you can just hand in anything. Oh, I thought that's what you wanted because <laughs> these people, they don't have to shred it. They just hit delete. So, uh, yeah, read, read those instructions very, very carefully. You didn't do that with my papers, did you? Shred them? No. I have them still. They're enshrined. You know. <laughs> well, they always say you can tell you're having a great conversation when you realize how fast the time has gone and you did not even realize how fast the time has gone. And I do want time for, for questions from the audience. But first, I would like, I would ask uh, Nicole DeBoer, to uh, you know, come forward, and Nicole is the executive director of SMOC, Southern Minnesota Arts Council, and uh, she'd like to tell you a little bit about some grant opportunities that are available for writers. So, Nicole, please. Hi, everybody. Um, if you're not aware of what SMOC is and does, we are an 18-county organization, southwestern Minnesota. Basically, the size of our organization is like a mini Minnesota inside the big one. We kind of have a little wing and we go out. It's about the same shape. Um, so we fund, we are basically an arts bank. You come, you apply to us for a loan to do an art project. And you could be an organization or you could be an individual artist. And it is all what was said about making sure you read the instructions for what they want when you apply to a publisher is the same thing when you apply to a grantor. Make sure you read all of our instructions ahead of time before you go to all of the time to apply for a grant and realize you didn't quite hit the mark. Um, I have with me a one-sheeter that just gives you deadlines for our next year. Our next year, our fiscal year starts July 1st and runs through the end of next June. And so these would be the deadlines for upcoming grant programs. And if I have one more minute, the three grant programs I would like to illustrate, because most of you are what we would call individual artists as writers. We have developing artist grants for up to $2,500. We have established career artist grants for up to $7,000. And then we have individual artists. This is a new grant program where the artist collaborates with a community and can do an art project where it's half about growing yourself as an artist and half about impacting a community through your art. And that's for up to $10,000 to do the, a project of that magnitude. Um, for writers, 
we do everything before you publish and after you publish. We do not fund self-publishing or, yeah, we do not fund self-publishing or vanity press. So before you publish, we would fund, um, if you need to take time and your employer would allow you to take unpaid time off, but you need somebody to give you money to have time to go away to a cabin and write for two weeks, you could apply for a grant for that. If you need to pay the editor, Ms. Jones, we would give you money to have someone edit your, manu your finished manuscript before the publishing happens. Um, if you were going to apply to contests to get acknowledged or to possibly have more and more people see your work, but you have to pay $20, $50, $100, and you have to do that 100 times, um, we would give you money for those contests. Then you get published, congratulations, you did that on your own. Afterwards, if you had a project, like I said about collaborating with a community, and you wanted to travel to libraries in the 18 county area and do readings and have some writing workshops that you yourself would hold, um, we, wouldn't, we may fund that kind of a, a series of traveling trips, mileage, your time, supplies, um, those are some kinds of things before and after the publishing that SMOC can do for you. And um, we hope we get some interest in writers in our region. This is a tremendous region of writers. We are very proud of all of the writers in the Southwest Minnesota region. We just don't have that many applicants. So I would give you a big boost of encouragement to look into us. And all our information is here and I'll put it somewhere over there, maybe by the water. Okay, so and, infringing on and other handouts that are available. I know Dana had a handout, Chris had a handout. Um, maybe we could just, <clears throat> you could start getting those passed around. And now I'm going to look to Michelle Leininger, who is the director of our Marshall Lyon County Library. And she too has some opportunities that she wants to share. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things that I heard when I moved here a couple years ago is that there was this tremendous writing community here and uh, we're a library and we talk to a lot of readers so it's actually a good connection. So when we wrote our strategic plan, one of our target audiences or, or people we wanted to help in um, the Lyon County area was writers and we're about halfway through that strategic plan so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing and what we have coming up. So uh, last year for the first time, we um, supported people who were doing NaNoWriMo, which is a uh, national uh, uh, novel, novel writing, writing month, and that's in November. And we encourage people to do the official NaNoWriMo, but not everybody can, can work 40 hours and take on writing, how many words is it? 50,000. 50,000 words in the month that um, Thanksgiving sits in. So not everybody can do that. So we also um, encourage people to just do whatever they wanted their goal to be. So even if it was poetry or it was um, trying to write personal essays or whatever that might be, that we would support that. So we had some uh, workshops. We also had write-ins where we provide space, electricity, Wi-Fi, um, snacks, and for an extended period of time, then people would come and they would be able to write. April is also Camp NaNoWriMo, so you can also, there's a couple months other than November that you can do this, so we have had three write-ins, uh, or we've had two. We've, um, have our third one this coming Monday. So if anybody wants to come, it's from five to nine this coming Monday. Um, and then July is another month and I'll um, talk to some people and see if they think that that might work and so we may have more in July. In preparation for NaNoWriMo, we decided to uh, launch our own writing group. So every Wednesday now, uh, we started last October and we meet every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 back in the Minnesota room and uh, we have a lot of beginning writers and we have a few more um, more established writers um, so it's a really good mix people come when they can if they can't come that's okay um, but we were just discussing before this started that it's amazing uh, 20 of the minutes is just writing and we're always amazed at how much you can get done in just 20 minutes um, of that writing 
And so that's every single Wednesday. Um, it just worked out that we got also very lucky that the um, libraries in the state of Minnesota decided that they also wanted to support uh, writers and they launched just this uh, last couple of months a new website it's called men writes men reads if you just do a Google search you will pull it up and it basically has the tools so it was interesting listening to the panel especially those who are using create space and self-publishing because the tools are actually here and because you live in the state of Minnesota they're free to you so to create uh, there's a button that says create and it gives you a tool it's called press books and what that allows you to do is either to write in that software or you can copy and paste there's a way to upload um, from word documents or other other uh, things that you might use and what it's going to do is going to format the book for you it has a number of themes it'll get that all formatted it'll uh, help you uh, figure out what you want to um, put on a back blurb, what you want the front cover to look like, and then it actually lets you export it as a uh, EPUB, which is what you need to have it to be in CreateSpace, is that correct? Mobius. Could be PDF, right? Mobius, actually. Yeah. Mobius, actually. Mobius okay. is what it exports as. Okay. Um, you need to import it on CreateSpace as either a Word document or a PDF. Okay, and PDF is another option out of, out of Pressbooks. Um, then they give you another option. You're, after you have published your book, i.e. exported it, either as EPUB or as uh, a PDF, they have a share button. And in that share button, you can um, uh, you upload it into a platform that's called Selfie. And this is something that has been underwritten by Library Journal, which is a professional journal uh, for librarians. But they realized that there were a number of uh, great writers out there who are self-publishing and they wanted to make that connection to libraries and librarians. So they created a platform. This is also now free to all Minnesotans and you can upload your work and it goes into something called Indie Minnesota. So everyone who has access to uh, this platform, which is all of Minnesota now because um, the state helped pay for that, um, it, uh, anybody can read it. Everybody can see it. It also means that uh, library journal reviewers also look through all of those. So as they look through those, if they think that this is a great title, they will also review it in library journal so librarians have access and may purchase those things. And so with that in mind, so they want people to use it, there is a contest coming up. Uh, it just launched at the beginning of this month and it's running through June 30th. So if you have an adult, or young adult fiction uh, novel, and they have a number of categories. You can upload it and um, for this contest, there is no fee for this particular contest. The, one, the main rule is you have to live in Minnesota and it has to be a self-published work. So uh, we have this information on our website, so you can go or you can talk to any of us at the library, we can get you information. But basically there's a $1,000 a contest prize for each for each book you can um, if you have multiple different books you can upload as many as you like um, it, you also will then um, the winners will be uh, uh, reviewed in library journal in December I think there's also an opportunity to go to uh, one of the uh, librarian conferences so you'll get to meet and sell your book to a lot of librarians so it's a great contest um, it's great for authors but it's also um, great for libraries in Minnesota. So we're hoping that this is really successful because if it is, the <coughs> Minnesota Library Foundation will continue it annually and continue to put the money up for it. So we hope you'll think also of your library at, as part of uh, your su writing support group. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, how about some questions from audience members for any of our panelists? Yes? I was wondering, you said you worked on, you finished in that sabbatical, one and a half novels, and then you finished, it would be three more, or almost. Right, yeah. How did you keep working when you had to go back to work? How did you keep that going? Uh, it's, it's very difficult, it was very difficult for me to, it's probably why I retired early, but it's very difficult for me to write fresh, I could edit, but then, this semester just took over and grading and 
So I did a lot of it in the summer. Uh, Marianne, during that time, went to graduate school, so I did summer school and overloads, and I was chair. So yeah, I don't know how I did it, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, but you just carve out time, and did, you did do a little bit. Did you still set a goal? Like, like maybe uh, you know, I, I tried that, but it, it didn't work. You know, my goal was not to get inundated by papers uh, and try to stay ahead of the papers and different things. So, um, but I, 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 I got, during that time, you know, I, I had a couple sabbaticals and at, at one time under Dr. Sweetland, we had money, the school had money and I got a paid leave just because he was giving out paid leaves. So thank you, Minnesota. But, so I had three semesters off during that time. Uh, and then once uh, Marianne got out of graduate school, I stopped being uh, teaching summer school, so I'd have the summer. So the draft of the the novel will be published in the fall, book three. I wrote that in a, a from from May to August. I wrote the the draft, just wrote every day. You know. And they're big books. So Other thank questions. You. There aren't any other questions. Oh, so brilliant. We we touched yeah. on well, absolutely everything you ever wanted to know. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Can I can I uh, run a little, just do a brief rundown on my handout? Yeah, the handout's so out there. A lot of people, this um, this first handout, the thirteen point roadmap, because I I go to a lot of different conventions and conferences and talk to a lot of people that uh, look and they're like, man, you have a lot of books. Like, how do you how do you do this? How do you do? How do you even just start? And uh, I wrote this article, this is on my blog. Uh, if you need uh, an expanded version, it's on my blog. It's also in my, my book right here, which is in the library, which uh, I have all sorts of, there's I think 100 articles in here about just like how to publish and go through the steps. And you know, number one, I mean, it's as simple as number one, write the book, uh, edit the book, uh, see, you know, look for your cover art, um, write your back cover, your blurb, decide on your pricing. And it sounds easy, just like, yeah. Twelve ninety nine. It's not as simple as that. There's some research that you have to do to find out where do you break even? How much does, do they charge to print the books? But then you got to think shipping and if you're doing returns. There's a lot of little factors to, to keep in mind. And so I have, a, I have detailed information on all of these. Um, like you said, it's in my book. It'd be awesome if you bought it. But 100% of this, 110% of this is on my blog for zero dollars. Um, and if you need a website, you can you can either Google me. Or you can uh, you can just go directly to my website and you can ask me for that later. But more important than maybe this, because this is this is I've decided to do uh, self-publishing. I want to be an independent author. Um, before you get to that, you got to ask your, ask yourself this one on uh, Tale of Two Pathways. Do I want to attempt to be a traditional author? Um, because those are two radically different paths. They both include writing a book and, and publishing it. A lot of the same things nowadays. Even to be a traditional author, you got to have you have to have a mailing list. You have to have a platform and a reason to speak that where people respond. They want to know, do I have built-in sales of a thousand books? If we pull the trigger and say, yes, we'll publish your book. So um, there's a lot of different things. A lot of it is crossover, but there are some very, very decided differences between the two. So first of all, you have to ask yourself, am I going to pursue the traditional publishing route or the independent publishing route? Um, it's, it's always good advice to try traditional first and uh, even if it takes you a bunch of time, that's, you're gonna learn something in the process. Um, and uh, in that time, you'll probably also find some more spelling mistakes that you and your editor both missed. Uh, but uh, so always look at everything as a, as a learning opportunity, but know where you're gonna go, and then just be willing to make a change. And some people are like, you know, I only wanna be an independent author. Or I know, like with, with poetry, with, poetry is probably more difficult than anything else. Um, most people that are poets that I know just say you know I'm just gonna I'm gonna independently publish this because I need people I need re readers first um, because you can't break in until you've already broken in uh, and that's that's the publishing model really as a whole um, but uh, yeah so there's some some resources there if you if you ever need to connect and more information um, talk to me I'll get you my blog and get you my information I enjoy encouraging others I think everyone has a story um, you just gotta put in the work and put it down. Okay, question back there. It wasn't really brought up, but one of the one of the things that I've heard about in the publishing circuit is keeping the rights to your writing in the sense of they want to make a movie, they want to 
putting in your new formats and your new things. And once you've ceded the right to be published and they take the right of you know the copyright in part from you or in total depending on the route you take and they can do whatever you want, how do you how do you avoid getting into a trap where suddenly your your books turn into a movie you don't recognize? <laughs> The, the whole point of publishing, if you are, especially with a traditional house, they're not taking the rights. You have sold them. Um, it's kind of like this. If, uh, if you have a car and it's an awesome car and you, like, this is full of nostalgia. It was your first car and it was awesome. It was great. You learned to drive in it. You went out in it every Friday night. All of your friends are like, man, you've got the best one on the block. And then you sell it. They can turn it into a demo derby car if they want. They can gut it. They can sell it for parts. Um, so you need to make sure that if you're selling it, that's what you want to do. And that's one of those, those differences with deciding traditional versus independent. And all of those things are very clear when they um, come down to offering a publishing contract with a traditional <coughs> publishing house. Uh, sometimes there is some loss of control. And there is, I mean, I mean there's a lot of, there's, there's give and take. Uh, which is why I know we, you talked before about you know, trusting you know, who you're working with. Um, at the end of the day, they may make some of those changes. But also, if they do, you're probably going to have been compensated. Uh, if, you're not, if, you, if you're selling it for these movie rights and you, they want to make some of these changes so that it's very, a very different book, um, you're, you're going to be able during that negotiation process to make sure that you are compensated accordingly for somebody eviscerating your baby. Yeah. Um, create space, I have the copyright, so they can't do anything to it without uh, my permission. But um, if, if, if you do ever sell the movie rights, uh, uh, I heard this actually at AWP, there was an agent that sold novels to make movies. He said, take your money and walk away from it. <laughs> he said, you're not a copywriter, you're not a screenwriter, they're going to hire screenwriters and they're going to change it. You know, Rowling uh, and the woman that does Outlander and, and even George Martin surrendered a bunch of his, you know, the way he wanted those to go. But very few authors maintain uh, strict control over their movies. Uh, I would be more worried about publishing houses that promise you the moon ending up with the copyright rather than you because create space, any reputable publishing house, you own the copyright. But some of these other ones, they're, they're buying the copyright from you, and, and you know, th that's a, that's a red, huge red flag. That's a volcano erupting. But you, um, you can negotiate within that contract how long they have the rights, maybe two years, it seems like mostly what I've seen. Yeah. You know, then, then it reverts back to you. But within those yeah, two but years. that's like two years that you can't publish right. it somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. But it's not two right. years that they can do they whatever can do they want. Yeah. You know, a guy that I know, um, he had a book published in Germany. They published it at like two thirds the size of the manuscript on full size paper, so like you know, a tiny little um, type, and he couldn't do anything about it for two years. Um, but then he got the rights back. And, but yeah, so you have, but you you can build in as much as you can. If you are a, a name brand author, you have much more clout in that contract. It's like, it's like being a rock star. Like John Mellencamp was Johnny Cougar for like the first five years and he didn't get a dime, you know. And, um, so, you, but you, you can negotiate. The, 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 um, the contract I had with this Texas company was a real, the publisher was a really good contract. After that, it was a horrible relationship, but the contract was great. Um, so there is some of some leeway, but but while you're under contract, depending on the terms, they have they have the book. I mentioned early in this conversation that when Larry McMurtry wrote Horseman Pass By, eventually it became the film HUD. And there's considerable differences between the book and the movie. But I think Larry McMurtry was one of the screenwriters. So he had some say on what happened, but clearly he went along with some major changes too because there's some pretty big changes. Be between. surprised what money does to you. Yeah. <laughs> How about some other questions? Tempt me, please, some movie yes. studio. Yes, <laughs> Michelle. I just wanted to follow up with a question. 
question. Um, there are certain types of writing too where you they have the copyright, correct? So I you know published in magazines. Um, sometimes they keep copyright. Academic um, publishers actually take can take your copyright. Um, sometimes I've even heard if you're like a guest blogger that that they maintain the copyright. Is is that what you've heard or is that accurate? Well, I think it's up to each individual. I mean, it would it would be up to each situation, so it's hard to make a. With, oh. with magazines and some of the short fiction and some of those, uh, really, what they're wanting when they're when they're buying a story from you is first copyright, uh, and usually then they'll have a period when they when they are negotiating what they're paying and everything their contract. They will usually tell you. Um, it's pretty common, like uh, like uh, we have a one year um, copyright on this. You can't publish this anywhere else. Uh, we want first publishing rights and to be noted uh, in uh, in the margin if you republish anywhere else. Um, and on on that idea of first publishing rights, that's typically when you're querying publishers what they want, because if it's going to be be big, they want to be the people with their foot in the door. If you have published your book already through CreateSpace or through Ingram or through Minnesota Rights, uh, and then you try and submit it to another publisher, uh, there it's it's almost always going to be a flat no. We won't, we don't even want to look at it because we can't buy first publishing rights. Uh, so just be aware that that is um, that goes with those different models. Uh, so sometimes when you ask yourself that question, am I traditional or independent? Uh, that how you answer that will can impact um, the other side of the coin. Uh, so make that decision first before you jump into something else, and then you, you have to write a whole different book if you're going to pursue the other path. And then a whole other pathway that has not been talked about today. And I think we could have a panel discussion just on this alone. So I'm just going to mention it briefly. Ask you a quick yes or no. Have any of you ever considered uh, audio books? I do audiobooks a lot. You, you have your own audiobooks? Do you read your own works? Uh, about half of them I do. Uh, and the same thing with traditional rights and whatnot. It is, if you're using the ACX platform, I've got, actually that's what inspired me to write this book. But some people ask me about how I got onto Audible. Mm -hmm. um, Audible is a, a mixed bag. I just recently discovered while trying to make some changes because I have one book that went from a traditional publisher and then I'm then I'm republishing it independently since my contract was up and I, and I think I can do better than the publisher did in all honesty. Um, I'm looking at my publishing rights and I'm like, oh man, they own, they own my rights for five years and I can't get out of it unless I make some other drastic changes uh, and, it's, uh, and one of them is actually just completely fixed. So there are, make sure you always, always, always read the fine print in everything. Uh, and if you want some details on that, uh, I, I can point you to some, uh, some good resources. Well, I know as someone who listens to a lot of audiobooks, the narrator can make or break whether yeah. you, you're going to finish that book or not. And sometimes the author is a very good narrator, and the book is enjoyable. And other times it's like you don't even want to finish the book because the narration is, is spoiling it for you. So I just wondered if, if you'd looked into that. Well, we should probably uh, wrap things up. I know. Oh, yeah, I, you know. I haven't, but if Jan read my book, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk. So anyway, first of all, again, I want to thank you all for being with us this afternoon on this first beautiful Saturday, spring Saturday that we've had for a very, very long time. And I again want to thank the Marshall Lyon County Library for cooperating with Mayfac Read Local today. And I hope it's the first of several joint ventures. And uh, oh, also to uh, Studio One for allowing us to film this today. Uh, don't know exactly when it's going to be on. What? It'll be on within a week. It'll be on It'll within be on a week. Within. And again, a thank you to uh, Nicole and Michelle for their contributions. I know the authors will stick around for a while. You can speak with them. As you can see by the table over there, they have books along. Uh, they've given you handouts. You can talk to them about the handouts. Please help yourself to the wonderful Perkins cookies, Perkins being one of the 
corporate sponsors of MAFAC. See, I just, I had put that in there. <laughs> and some under, other wonderful snacks. And on behalf of MAFAC's Reed Local Committee, myself along with Dana Miller and Deb Amon, Crystal Luwaji, and Charlotte Wendell, and the entire MAFAC board, MAFAC being the Marshall Area Fine Arts Council. If you don't know where we're located, we're on 3rd Street, right in the heart of downtown Marshall. We are the place with the, the purple awning. So please stop in sometime if you've not done so yet. And once you start visiting, visit often. So thank you for being with us today.